All right, hey, what's up? Uh, now our next topic is gonna be on nationalism. Okay, the first thing you need to know about nationalism is you gotta know the definition. When you think of nationalism, a really simplistic definition is just to say it, it's talking about your love you have for your country. It's the love that ties together people who share a culture, who share a common history, common language, so on and so forth. Um, the idea of nationalism is something we take for granted today, but really it starts with the French Revolution. The French Revolution is the first time that people started to think of themselves not just about, you know, part of their local community, not just as, um, you know, the, the people who answer to a king or tied together um, from uh, loyalty to a king. They actually were loyal to each other, that there was a brotherhood among French people. If you remember the the, um, the French Revolution, the idea of the French Revolution was liberté, equalité, fraternité, which I hope you don't speak French because that pronunciation was horrible, but again it's this idea of uh, liberty, equality, and fraternity. And fraternity literally means a brotherhood. This idea that there was a bond among French people. And um, the person who really used that was Napoleon. We see this again in the Latin American revolutions. This idea that the people should come together, tie together, and, and gain their independence. That's one of the big things you see um, whenever you think of um, nationalism, whenever you think of that love for your country, I want you to just associate it with the idea of self-rule. That when you feel nationalism, you want to run your own country. You want independence. You are not going to want to be ruled by an outsider. And this force of nationalism, um, as you can see in the top right, has a huge impact on global history. It's, it still it has impact today. It's probably one of the biggest drivers of um, of foreign policy today. Um, what we're going to take a look at is um, the fact that nationalism can bring people together as it did in Germany and Italy, but also it can also tear people apart. That an empire, which is basically uh, made up of uh, many different nations under the rule of one leader, the empires generally fall apart due to the forces of nationalism. That's what we're going to say. All right, and one other definition I want to give you is this idea of a nation state. All right, what is a nation state? Um, this is kind of an advanced idea, so I'm, I'm hoping you guys can follow me. The thing is, is that a nation is not the same thing as a country. Let me say that again. A nation is not the same thing as a country. A country is simply a political item you know like if you look at the if you look at the map right the lines on a map saying this is where france is this is where spain is this is where you know whatever whatever country russia germany what have you those are simply lines on a map those are political differentiations of where one country begins and another ends um and a nation however isn't lines on a map Th those are things that go beyond it that this bond that people have with each other. And the lines on a map may change very quickly, but a, a, the identity of a nation doesn't. What happens is, is um, when we think today of countries, very often we think of countries and nations as the same thing, and that's because of the rise of what we call nation states. This idea that if you look for people who um, are French, French people, the nation of France, right? If you look for French people, well, there's one place to look. That's the country of France. The country of France is filled with French people. That's what we call a nation state, right? So like you can see from the picture, you know, if you look for a Portuguese person, you're going to find them in Portugal. You look for a Mexican person, they're found in Mexico, and so on and so forth. That's the idea of a nation state. And, and when you have a nation state, when the country is filled with people of one nation, these tend to be very stable countries and more unified countries, all right? So that's the idea of a nation state, all right? Um, hopefully this idea is going to make more sense when I show you examples of nations that do not have their own country. All right, but we'll get to that later. Um, the basic things you need to know for purposes of the regions, like I said, just know this idea of nationalism. It's this love you have for your people that, that brings people together. And like I said, this love for people who share your culture, this love of country, 
we're first going to see this with Italy. All right. Um, as take a look at the map on the top right. As you can see, this, this Italian peninsula, at this point in history, um, it is divided up into many different states. And some of these states are independent. Some of these states are run by uh, Austria. Some are controlled by Spain. Uh, they're all many different forms of foreign control. Some are independent. But what they all have in common is that all of these places are filled with Italian people. All the people, even though they're divided into many different states, all of these people share a culture, they share a language, they are Italians, all right? And what happens is, is a movement begins to create a nation for Italian people, all right? That they want to form one nation, a nation state filled for Italians. Um, one of, and the main people who are involved with this is what you see before you. All right, and so we're going to start with the guy at the bottom left. We're going to start at Mazzini. And Mazzini is known as the heart of the revolution. Um, and he is known as the heart of the revolution because he is the person who promotes this idea of Italian nationalism. And he forms this group known as Young Italy, and he is very strong about this idea that Italian people should live together in a country, and this is the idea he promotes, all right? Now, at the same time Mazzini is promoting this idea of Italian nationalism, um, there is this person, Cavour. And Cavour is the prime minister of Sardinia. Mazzini is also from Sardinia. But anyway, he's the prime minister of Sardinia. Now, Cavour is known as the brains of the revolution. And the reason why is that as Mazzini is kind of leading with his heart on his sleeve, he really believes and loves this idea of young Italy. But Cavour, he is more, um, he's more pragmatic. He's more focused on um, political realities. And what happens is Cavour is the prime minister of Sardinia, and his boss is King Victor Emmanuel II. And he wants King Victor Emmanuel to become more powerful. Sardinia is, if you look at the map on the top right, Sardinia is the, the gray thing. Uh, it's the gray state that's at the top left of the map. You can see where it says the Kingdom of Sardinia. It's that piece, and it's also this large island off the coast of Italy, the, the other gray island that's beneath it. Those two areas make up Sardinia. And he works for the king of Sardinia, and he wants to see his king become more powerful. So this idea of nationalism to him makes a lot of sense. He's like, we should form a nation of Italy, and this nation should be under the rule of my boss, King Victor Emmanuel. And so Cavour uses, um, again, he's the brains of the revolution. He is going to use a philosophy known as real politic. He is going to make... Um, he's going to use diplomacy, he's going to make alliances with powerful people, all in an effort to bring together the Italian peninsula into one country. And he is, and it works. Um, it happens through a series of wars and elections and so on and so forth, to a level of detail you don't need to worry about. But suffice to say, um, he's going to be doing this political maneuvering, he's going to make these arrangements, and he is going to, Italy will become unified. Um, the other figure that you really need to know is, um, is Garibaldi. Now, Garibaldi is known as the sword of the revolution, and the reason he's known as the sword of revolution is he is going to fight um, he is actually from the Kingdom of Two Sicilies. And the Kingdom of Two Sicilies, again, if you look at that map on the top right, the Kingdom of Two Sicilies is the very bottom of the boot. It includes the very bottom of the boot as well as the island of Sicily. All right, those two islands. And those two areas of Italy are under the control of the Spanish. And Garibaldi is going to lead a revolution. He forms this army known as the Red Shirt Army, named after... Garibaldi happens to wear a lot of red shirts, so that's where the name comes from. Anyway, his red shirt army is going to overthrow the Spanish leadership. It's going to gain its independence. And what Garibaldi does is, after the Kingdom of Sardin to, uh, Sicily gains independence, he allows for an election to take place, and this part of Italy ends up choosing to join with King Victor Emmanuel. So what happens is King Victor Emmanuel and Cavour work together. They unite the northern part of 
the Italian peninsula. Garibaldi gains control of the southern part of the Italian peninsula. They come together, and that's how the nation of Italy is formed. All right? And again, this is this idea of nationalism, that the reason why all of these states form one country is because they, sh they are a nation. They share this culture, language, history, so on and so forth. Okay, So that's how Italy is formed. Similar idea in Germany. All right? Germany, at this point, does not exist. Instead, there is a collection of German states collection of German, also principalities, they'll call it, because all German princes run different parts of Germany. And the largest area, the largest concentration of German people are under the rule either of Prussia, again, Prussia with a P, and Austria. Those are the two largest concentrations of Germanic people. And again, Otto von Bismarck, very similar to Cavour, Otto von Bismarck is also um, the... Prime Minister, he is this, um, he is, works for the Kaiser Wilhelm I, okay? Works for Kaiser Wilhelm. And very similar to Gavor, he wants to unite Germany under the rule of his boss. And he is able to do that basically through three wars. There's three main wars he has to fight. He has to fight Austria, he has to fight, uh, uh, what was it, uh, against the, uh, the, he has to fight the Danish war, he has to fight against uh, Austria, and then his final war is against France, all right? Suffice to say, he is known, you must know, when you hear Otto von Bismarck, I always pronounce his name with a German accent, that way you won't forget, Otto von Bismarck, when you hear that, you must think blood and iron. That is how Otto von Bismarck is going to unite Germany. Through blood and iron, he is going to, they, they're going to fight. It's through three wars that Germany becomes united, right? And he is very successful. And um, his ability, they're going to, sorry, I called Otto von Bismarck a prime minister. His actual title is chancellor. My apologies. So the Otto von Bismarck, the chancellor, which again, he, is, he's able to unite Germany under the rule of um King Wilhelm I, and he is going to take the title of Kaiser, all right? And now Germany becomes a country. So like I said, um, this idea of nationalism is going to bring together countries, all right? But the problem is, is that um, although it brings together people who share a common culture, the nationalism also has the effect of breaking up empires. The two empires it breaks up is first the Austrian Empire, which we're not going to get into detail. Just know that the Austrian Empire splits up because of this. Uh, but the other big empire that it is going to help end is the Ottoman Empire. If you take a look at the picture, if you remember, the Ottoman Empire comes um, into being um, after, if you remember this from ninth grade, after the fall of the Byzantine Empire. Remember there was the Roman Empire and the Roman Empire split into an eastern and western half. Eastern half became the Byzantine Empire. The Ottoman Empire conquers the Byzantine Empire, and then the, it becomes this very, very powerful um, uh, collection of states. Um, the Ottoman Empire is actually going to exist until World War I. World War I is going to destroy the Ottoman Empire, so it's going to hold on until then. But the Ottoman Empire, as you can see, um, the Ottoman Empire is, um, it ends up, the forces of nationalism actually start to weaken the the Ottoman Empire. Um, as you can see, the Ottoman Empire extends throughout, as you can see, into it extends from Europe um, with Greece and Bosnia, that's kind of like Eastern Europe, into Turkey, which gets you into the Middle East and Asia, as well as into Northern Africa, where you see Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, Algeria. This huge area is all under the control of an empire. Now, if you take a look at this map, are Greek people the same as Egyptian people? Well, of course not, right? Those are two different nations. Just like Egyptian people aren't the same as Libyans, they're not the same as Algerians, they're not the same as Turks, they're not the same as Bulgarians, Romanians, Serbians. These are all different nations. And each of these nations that make up the Ottoman Empire, each of these nations feel nationalism. And the Ottoman Empire is actually under the control of Turks, 
okay? So that orange piece, you can see um, the orange piece on the upper right, that's actually that part that sticks out into between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. That's where the country of Turkey is found today. And Turkey is actually named, it's not named after the gobble gobble bird. Turkey is named after the fact that it's under the control of Turks, okay? That's their national. Name. And the Turkish people control the Ottoman Empire. So Egyptians, Greeks, the Libyans, Algerians, so on and so forth, these people do not want to be ruled by Turks. They feel nationalism. They want self-rule. Greece wants to be under the rule of Greeks. Egyptians want to be ruled by Egyptians, and so on and so forth, all right? And that's going to help lead to, there's going to be independence movements throughout the Ottoman Empire, and that's going to help break up the Ottoman Empire. By the end, the Ottoman Empire just shrinks, shrinks, shrinks until the Ottoman Empire is gone, and we're left with the country of Turkey, which exists today. All right. The first country to make a break from the Ottoman Empire is Greece. Um, they gained their independence in 1829. Um, as I'm sure you remember from ninth grade, the Greek culture is very influential. A lot of Europeans kind of, you know, tie a lot of their cultures back to it. So there's a lot of European support for Greek being in, Greece being independent. Um, they're going to start breaking off. These other countries are going to start breaking off. As you can see from that pink box there, this Balkan area. Okay, the Balkans is this group of nations right above Greece, all right? So this is this Eastern European area. The Balkans, I want you to remember this area of the map, because in World War I, this is, becomes a very important area of the world, because the Balkans are known as the powder keg of Europe. It's actually Otto von Bismarck who calls them this. It's because these forces of nationalism, of people who want to break off, who want their independence, this is one of the forces that's going to lead to the start of World War I. This forces of nationalism unleashed as the Ottoman Empire starts to fall apart. All right? Um, and like you see on the right, the Ottoman Empire equals the sick man of Europe. The, uh, as the Ottoman Empire starts falling apart, as it starts becoming weaker and weaker, the nations of Europe see it as a target um, for... Um, expanding their influence and expanding their empires into this area. All right, um, the last thing I'm going to talk about with the Ottoman Empire is the Armenian Genocide. The Armenian Genocide actually takes place during World War I, but I'm going to talk about it now because this is another aspect of nationalism. The love you have for your country, right, can be a wonderful thing. Like I said, I, I love 4th of July, okay? Baseball games and apple pie and waving the red, white, and blue. That, that can be a very positive thing. And the idea of self-rule, that you want to throw off the chains of your oppressor and rule yourself. Again, that, that can, you can think of that in a positive light. But nationalism, if, if, nationalism can also go to crazy town, all right? Let's just leave it at that. You can sometimes have nationalism that, that goes too far. And the Armenian Genocide is an example of that. The Armenian Genocide happens because um, during this period where the Ottoman Empire starts falling apart and the nation of Turkey gets created, what you start having is this wave where um, inside Turkey there is this push to say there should be Turkey for the Turks. Turkey for the Turks. And what does this mean? They feel nationalism. So the Turkish people feel this bond of nationalism. They feel this connection to their fellow Turks. But the problem is, is that Turkey isn't just filled with Turks. That Turkey is the home of other groups of people. It is the home of other nations of people. And one of the other nations that lives within Turkey is a group of people known as Armenians. All right, And Armenians have a different culture, have a different history, a different religion. All right. Turks are Muslim people that, again, are of the ethnicity of Turks. Um, the Armenians, however, are Christian people, all right? And they live within this land of Turkey. They've been there for millions, millions, you know, I forget, thousands of years or whatever. Very, very long history, way before the, the foundation of Turkey and the Ottoman Empire and such. And, but what happens is during this wave of strong Turkish nationalism, during this period of World War I, the Turks end up trying to wipe out the Armenian people. That's what it means to have a genocide. Genocide means you are 
purposefully trying to wipe a nation off the face of the earth. You're trying to kill them all and get rid of them all. Either by straight up killing them, having a forced march, or trying to kick them off your land. Um, and this is what's happening. It's incredibly brutal. Okay, the world is aware of it, it's happening. You can see this picture, I thought, I was like, oh my God, is this a fake picture? But this is actually an example of one of the things they did. Again, Armenians were Christian people, so this is an example where they crucified some Armenian women. There are many, many pictures, if you do a quick Google search, of um, the forced marches sending Armenian people with only what they could carry in their hands, being forced across deserts, knowing that they would die on the forced march. Um, there are stories about Armenian people going through towns where the Turkish people come out and just start killing them. Um, there are many stories of Armenian women being raped because that's another way to wipe out um, a nation is by with forcible rape now the 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 bloodline gets impure um, there are stories about Armenian children being taken from their parents and given to Turkish families to raise in again in an attempt to wipe out the Armenian culture um, and things like that so this is uh, the first recognized genocide um, and it happens, and, and some people credit, um, there's supposedly a quote from Adolf Hitler, where um, when he was first putting together his, uh, you know, his plans for the final solution and to wipe out all of the Jewish people and things like that, supposedly um, there's this quote that somebody told him, listen, you can't do this. The, the nations of Europe are going to stop you. They're, they're never going to, the world isn't going to let you go forward with this. They're going to stop you. And supposedly Hitler said, yes, but who today remembers the Armenians? Like, what do you mean people are going to stop me? Nobody stopped the Armenian genocide. They're not going to stop me either. And so this is one of the big pushes that the more you ignore genocide, the more you don't act on it, it empowers future genocides. All right. So this was just the first one. It is certainly not the last. All right. Um, the the other thing as um, the other thing I want to just mention now is this idea when we get to Turkey, like I said, the Ottoman Empire is going to fall apart in World War One, and you're going to have the birth of this new nation known as Turkey. You um, should know about this guy. His name is Kemal Ataturk, and you literally can't get anything easier than this guy. I mean, his last name literally has the word Turk in it. So yes, Ataturk is the leader of. Turkey. I mean, you can't get any easier than that. Um, and what uh, uh, what Kemal Ataturk is known for is he is going to modernize Turkey. Um, he is going to give uh, it is more secular, modern. Uh, you have a vote for women. Um, this is one of the issues actually. It's coming up now. If you happen to read the paper now, um, there's been some changes in Turkey right now where uh, it's under the leadership of. Uh, uh, a, uh, a ruler who is trying to push Turkey more towards a um, Muslim-dominated, uh, more conservative religious government. So a lot of the people of Turkey this is um, are fighting against this because they want to stay secular. They want to stay, um, uh, you know, to maintain rights for women and things like that. They want to turn. They don't like this idea that Turkey is being pushed towards more. Um, uh, uh, Islamic fundamentalism. All right, so it's a, it's going on right now. But again, you need to know this name Kemal Ataturk. He is again the father of Turkey. He is going to make Turkey more secular and um, uh, and is basically the founding father of this new country. All right. So the other thing I want to explain to you. Remember, I started talking to you earlier about the idea of a nation state. That sometimes you can have a, a group of people, like if you go to look for Spanish people, you find them in Spain. You look for Italian people, they're found in Italy. You look for German people, they're in Germany. That you can find a nation within a state, within a particular country. Okay? The, the other challenge, so that's a positive thing, right? You have nationalism, these people tied together, they create these countries where people are, you know, they're very stable and they're very united. The problem that we're seeing today, and this is, uh, this is the issue of nationalism that's, that's very difficult, is that there are sometimes nations that do not have their own country. All right? The problem comes where you have a nation, a group of people who say we are a separate ethnicity, we have a separate religion, a separate culture, a separate history, and we 
want self-rule. We feel nationalism and we want self-rule. And this can create a lot of problems. This can cause, this is what leads people to terrorism. It can lead it to um, revolutions, revolts, and things of that nature. Some of the ones that exist today, groups of people who are, have either discussed or debating the ideas of independence. One is Chechnya. I don't know if you guys remember a few years ago, there was the Boston Marathon. There were two brothers who set off an explosion. Their idea, this was an act of terrorism, and it was in support of Chechnyan independence. Chechnya, as you can see, it, this is this Republic of Chechnya. Chechnya is actually located inside of Russia, but there is this movement inside Chechnya where the Chechen people want to have an independent country. All right? They feel nationalism, they would like to be independent. Um, the Basque region of Spain, this is the Basque people. Again, you can see it here. They also, um, there's a lot of terrorism actually, uh, you know, early in like the 2000s, um, more in the earlier 2000s, there, there had been some terrorism there. But again, this was a big independence movement. Scotland actually has just recently had a vote as to whether or not they wanted to become independent from the United Kingdom. And this push actually, it didn't go through. They ended up voting to stay within the United Kingdom and stay part of the UK. Uh, stay part of the British Isles. However, with Brexit, there has been more discussion as to whether or not Scotland will stay a part of the UK or go independent. So this is this idea of Scottish nationalism has been building for a while. Um, you know, they're at this point they're not going to be independent. They're going to stay within the UK, but it's something that could change later. We'll see how this situation develops. But Scottish nationalism has been growing. There is a growing percentage of the population that would like to become an independent country, independent from, um, from the United Kingdom. Um, and finally, the Kurds in the Middle East. This is a really key thing. Um, the Kurds, or the Kurdish people, are actually one of our strongest allies in the fight against ISIS. But as you can see from the map, the Kurdish people control areas in Turkey, Syria, Iraq, Iran, Armenia. Um, and, you know, in Turkey, the Turks consider the Kurds to be an enemy. They want to wipe them out. Um, and this has been very challenging because we consider Turkey an ally, yet we consider the Kurds an ally. So this has made the fight against ISIS very, very challenging. Um, uh, Iraq, there is a little bit of an area uh, where Kurds have at least kind of an independent um, republic, so there is some kind of self-government there. But in Turkey, it's been a real big challenge. But um, yeah, this is something that you'll hear if you're hearing the news about Kurds. The Kurds are a separate ethnic group. They feel nationalism. They want self-rule. They want an independent country. They do not have it yet. There is no independent Kurdistan, but that's, they are fighting ISIS in hopes that it will get them an independent country, but they don't have it yet. All right, so uh, that is nationalism in a nutshell. I uh, hope you understand it. Like I said, it's a really um, in very powerful force that is really changing the world uh, then and now. All right, bye-bye.